And I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now in 19 days, in 19 days, I would have been getting married. Except exactly two months ago, I stared my ex fiance straight in the eyes as he said to me, Bumi, this is not working out. I promise you. Let's call it off. I gathered my belongings. And the walk between Starbucks and my car was both the shortest and the longest walk of my life. And yes, you heard me right. Umshatwa mupelele Starbucks. Emma Coffin in a sematien. What's some fun and grand now? Now it was the shortest walk because I could literally feel my heart beat as fast as I was walking. I couldn't wait to get to my car. But it was also the longest walk because I realized when I got into my car that I was just waiting to exhale. What just happened? I drove straight to my mom's house. So it's drove straight to my mom because what does a girl do after that? All right, drove straight to my mom's house. And my mom gave me one look, and I gave her a nod, and she knew Nzokulma missing red. And we let it go. Now, while this was utterly devastating for me, I would be lying if I said I was surprised. Because two months before, I made the biggest mistake of my life. I made a very dangerous prayer. Now I'm pretty sure you all know this prayer, right? Let Egboni saga shuguti. God's not dead. Let mo funukbana if heaven has an express line, utanda zayona because it doesn't even take God two working days to answer. Let's all recite this prayer, Lord. If He is not the one, remove Him. What you Jesu? Okay. Hold my mkele. I've got this. Woo! And boy, did I start seeing flames. After that prayer, yo, a year that started off as such a dream slowly became a nightmare. Rapid changes happened, right? And for the very first time in my life, after this experience, I think I got to understand a passage of scripture that I wrestled with God about a lot in the past. And it's there somewhere in Exodus. I think it starts in chapter 4, where God says to Moses, listen, but I need you to go to Egypt and go and get my kids out of there. And then God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Now I'm just like, sir, your plan is to get them out. Why are you hardening Pharaoh's heart? But before then you read, God did say, he will be stubborn. He won't want to let my children go. But then I understood, God wanted to make sure that it is unequivocally clear that getting the Israelites out of Egypt was his will and his will alone. Because if Pharaoh had just said, ah, man, but it's fine, go. Neighboring countries would be like, oh, Pharaoh's such a nice king. Oh my gosh, he let them go. But God wanted, to, God wanted it to be so clear, would see, this is me. All the wonders and the signs that happened leading up to the release of the Israelites was because God wanted it to be clear. Now, here's the thing. I'm starting to see flames. I'm like, hey, man, this is not good for me. So it, 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 it can be all right. I need to get out of here. But uh, I'm no quitter. Me. I'm a survivor. <laughs> I'm not going to give up. <laughs> I'm not going to stop. This is my man. I'm going to work harder. Oh, but the harder I worked, the harder my Pharaoh's heart got. Yo! Plague after plague after plague. And I'm like, Lord, please make it better. I want this to work. And God's like, I want you to see what my will is. Oh, Lord, but my Pharaoh, come now, we're having garlic and bread. And God's like, ah, ah. 
my will is what will prevail. I wonder how many of us pray away our promise because it's currently presenting as plagues. Lord, but you made a prayer. You told me what you want. After, I know what you want. So are you really going to pray away your promise because right now you're experiencing plagues? Stop that. I wonder how many of us are praying away our, our platform because it's currently presenting as a problem. You know that boss, Lord, Mina, I'm tired of this man. I, I don't want to be in this job anymore. Let, I, I need to be let go. And God's like, where in Afudzi? How's that going to be platform? How's that going to I don't know how many of us really, because things are so painful, things are so tough, we even pray away the very things that we want. But ngoba survivor. I two weeks ago, I was at a prayer revival. Yeah, it must have been two weeks ago. I was at a prayer revival. And Besang it was still very, very difficult for me. And I found myself saying very, very, very weird words to God in prayer. I said to him, Lord, thank you for this experience. I'm like, hey, this is not the nice experience. Actually, no, I take that back. But no, I, thought, I thanked him for the experience. And in that moment, I understood James 1, verse 2 to 4. My lovelies, okay, that's not what the Bible says. Brethren. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Count it what now? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And then it says, let patience have its perfect work. So that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Ooh. Ooh. Is it possible that we are praying away our perfection? Because in the moment, we are being pruned in patience. Lord, but... Uh, 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 and then God says to you, but you said... You know, and... <laughs> Even, even with all of this, right, it's, it's, it's nice. I'm getting perspective, and God is speaking to me about this experience of mine. And I, I was quite upset because I said, Lord, you know, even from the beginning of this thing, I never stopped praying. Why did you not say, I know where this is going to end? Shalala. I, so I've got this tradition where every year I ask God for a birthday gift, right? For my birthday. I just turned 30 in a, couple, a couple of weeks ago. So, you better listen to what I'm saying. Um, and in, in, when I was 28, I said to God, Lord, for 29, we're getting married. And my guy was like, yo, shawty. Like, hey, sir. And when I started to see what time and Lomuntu interested, I said, okay, Lord, if he's really somebody I should be entertaining, let him pursue me. Because we all know there's a difference between interest and being pursued, right? Mm. Uh, let him pursue me. Oh, and my guy pursued me excellently. I thought, I even feel la, I've made it. Pursued, and I continue to pray. Then when I suspected he's going to ask me out to be his girlfriend, I said, Lord, I think Thursday is happening. So is it okay if I move ahead or not? And there was silence. Silence means? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thursday I dolled up and I was sitting opposite my guy and it's like, yo, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're born with talent. Oh, yeah, peeing. Of course, you're born. And it happened. Not only that, though. If we, is it me? Him. 
I got funny season story, but if you get angry, so lot of angalo. I prayed. Oh, I I think I even fasted. I'm not sure. I'm not sure because you know trauma. I prayed though. I was like, Lord, I want to see this, that, and the third. And guess what I saw? This, that, and the third. Ngati see how weng kianyala for twenty nine. And things just started unraveling. And I said to God, Lord, where were you? Because you could have easily warned me. Aren't we buddies like that? Where was your spirit? And then God took me to Luke chapter 4. And I want to read it because Luke chapter 4, verse 1. It's then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Hold up. Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, was led by that Spirit into the wilderness. Could it be possible that we are in our wildernesses because it is God exactly who wants us in there? But Lord, why? Does my pain make you happy? Help me understand. This is some narcissism behavior. What's going on? And then God answered me in verse 14 of that very same scripture. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. So he gets into the wilderness filled with the Holy Spirit. And when he comes out, he comes out with power. With the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you, if you were ever tempted to, to not pray away your power because it is presenting as pain. I know the wilderness is painful. I know it hurts. I know it's not a place you want to be in. But if you got in there filled with the Holy Spirit, trust that you will walk out of there with the power of the Holy Spirit. So do exactly what you are meant to do. And I guess in this case, to bloom where you're planted. So I remember while I was still at my mom's house, I think I stayed there a week because whoo, I said to my mom, I remember it was a Thursday. I woke up and I said, Mama, I'm so angry. I'm so angry because I get that it's God's will and he has the final say, right? But what about my will? I can't really have been given free will agency. What about what I wanted? What if I still wanted? What? And God said to me, Mpumi, you made me Lord of your life. That was your choice. I can't mess it up. I said, what now? And he said, free will. You want to talk about free will? You used your will to make me Lord, and I can't mess it up. What kind of father would I be if I let you? No, you will not be okay just because I want to give you the satisfaction of making a choice. You made me Lord of your life. And I'm not going to mess it up. Guys, let me tell you something. Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit take their roles very seriously. They take their roles very seriously. And if you're going to surrender, they will move heaven and earth for you. And while we're talking about God's will, in 1 Thessalonians 4, I think it's verse 3. It says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. Now, I had to be very honest to Guzzi. I had to be very honest with where I was. And God said to me, Bumi, if it doesn't look like me, if it doesn't sound like me, if it doesn't behave like me, if it doesn't so much as resemble me in any way, it is not me. It is not from me. And because you are mine, I will do whatever it takes to win you back. And that gave me such a peace. And the peace I want to leave you with today is 
if you're in a situation where you are asking, Lord, what are you doing? Because nothing makes sense. This is not what we discussed. This is not what our prayers were looking like. What is going on? I want you to know that God, as your father, always has to strike a balance between loving you in the present and loving you in the future. It's quite a tricky balance, you know, but the thing is, all we know is our present, right? We know what's the own God's God's like right now. But me na gibona ngali guamanji. And if I say no, trust that it's coming from a good place. God always has to strike a balance between loving you right now and loving you in the future. I love it in 1 Corinthians 13 when Paul says, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. God knows you fully. He knows your future fully. And all you see right now is all you see. But he sees now. He sees tomorrow. He sees the future. And so if you're ever wondering, Lord, what are you doing? He is loving you right now and making sure that when you step into the future that he saw, you still understand his love. What may not feel like love today, trust and believe. You don't want to step into the future and be like, Lord, what was going on? He has to make sure. Good. See, when you get there, you still say, what a loving father. What a loving God. I, there's a song I want us to do together because I want you to listen to the lyrics of... No, but we're going to do it in English. We're going to do it in English. 162. 162. Listen to the words of the song, okay? Now, something about me. I sing for a very prestigious choir, okay? Quaver vocal group. We're having a winter's experience next week, Saturday. And, I, and the reason I'm telling you this is because but I don't want you to treat it as an audition. You audition you already, and I made it. So if this doesn't work out, it's just the devil. But me, I sing for Quaver. Okay, let's do 162. Because of disappointments. No ways. This 
my song through endless ages. Jesus led me all the way. And I shared what I shared because I wanted those who needed a hug from God to get a hug from Him right now. It's okay. God is still in control. And that should give you so much comfort because if there's one being who knows what they are doing, it's God. Only experience and a track record. And your song through endless ages will be that He led you all the way. Now let's get into the sermon and I'll be very quick because this cuts the city girl bloom where you are planted what is that chatter about what was she doing nothing are rude nothing are rude bloom where you are planted when i heard this i thought it was such a cute theme because it's so suggestive right it's so encouraging bloom where you're planted i'm not trying to be cute today I'm not trying to be suggestive today. I'm going to be very instructive. And the instruction is bloom because you are planted. Because I think I'm going to be bloom you planted. I'm going to planted. No, no, no. Bloom because you are planted. Now, by profession, I am a speaker and a purpose alignment strategist. Um, Seven's one is to make sure or to help professionals who feel stuck in jobs they settled for and those they quite frankly hate, really, to discover their purpose and turn it into a fulfilling and impactful career with high earning potential. Now, I'm saying this because when I heard this theme and whenever somebody talks about anything that's got to do with flourishing or being great or thriving, the very first thing that comes to my mind is purpose. I don't think there is anybody who can really bloom and thrive outside of exactly what God created them to do. You can do things. I mean, you know, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your heart and you can subscribe to. But in actual reality, if you really want to excel, if you really want to thrive, the best place to do it is for the very exact reason that God made you. And so I'm going to give you five points that will teach you how to bloom because you are planted. All right? And I'm not a preacher, so if you're expecting, it's not going to happen. We're going to keep it here. We're going to keep it here. No, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. I'm a teacher, and so I hope and pray that after I've shared what I have prepared, that will go out there and actually implement. I always say, just give God a try. Try him on. Try him on. If he doesn't fit, but chances are, I'm an omnipotent, omnipresent. There's no way he's not going to fit. So just try it on and see. So I'm going to share a story. I'm going to be teaching or preaching from a story that I want us to follow. And we find the story in Exodus chapter 1 right through to Exodus chapter 4. You won't need to read your Bibles, but if ulo umuntu lo othi, mega athi funde khaya and then un DM elapha ka Instagram, we'll have a discourse. Okay. So, we're going to talk about the story of Moses. We already started earlier talking about Pharaoh, but now I want us to talk about Moses and the whole journey of the Israelites out of Egypt and onto the promised land. In Exodus chapter 1, we find that after the famine a whole lot of Hebrews, a whole lot of Israelites found themselves in Egypt because there was no food. And you know, Joseph, the wise dreamer, made it a point that everybody comes to Egypt to come and collect food to eat. And so all his brothers, his dad, and their kids and their grandkids and all of those people made it to Egypt. Now, some time had passed. Joseph died. His brothers died. And their families remained. And now they, these people were very, Hebrew people were very fertile. They kept giving birth and birth and birth. And Pharaoh was like, near man, if I let this continue, if a war should break out, these people will side with our enemies. Let's make sure that we enslave them. The harder they worked, I the survivor, the harder they worked, the more they grew. And Pharaoh was like, okay, this is getting very, very frustrating. What I need you to do, midwives, is that just make sure you nip it in the bud and you, you cancel the, the seed. All right? The Hebrew midwives were like, okay, Pharaoh. Then the women came. I go, what's going on? And the, the midwives are like, you know, Hebrew women, 
Hebrew women are very strong. They are very self-sufficient. By the time they get to us, they've already got their kids. And of course, that was a lie. They feared the Lord. They were never going to take a life. And when he realized, we'll see, they are lying to him. He said, okay, all the boys, throw the boys into the river and let them all die. And that's what, the, that's what they did. But in, the, in that time, in that era, there was a woman called Jochebed, and what she did was save her child. Now, I'm running ahead of myself. I said I'm going to give you five points, right? When you're considering, Lord, how do I bloom? What is it that I do that will allow me to bloom? What is it that I need to step into that will truly say me and what you've created me for? The very first thing is to pay, pay attention to the era of your existence. It's no mistake that you were born in this generation and living in this time. Honestly, I mean, my sister always tells me stories of when she was in high school and it was And I'm thinking if I was living in that makes you want just been so processed cousins on prepare early lunch because I was never gonna do it. But God knew that this was the season, this was the era. And so I want you to pay careful attention to the era that you were born in. What is going on? And what contribution can you make to that, right? I, I, I set the context because in the time that Moses was born, this is what was happening. The king, want, or the king or Pharaoh wanted all Hebrews to die. Now, the second thing I want to step into is Jochebed says, I am not throwing my child into the river. And she prepares a, a raft, I would say, using um, per, uh, reeds, let's just say reeds, and pitch and tar, right? Puts the baby in there. And the, the Bible I was reading says, Jochebed saw that there was something special about Moses, right? Puts Moses in this basket, in this raft, and allows him to drift into the river. Now, one day, Pharaoh's daughter, the princess of Egypt, goes out to take a bath. And she sees this basket in the river and is like, what is going on there? Someone bring me that basket. They take it out to see that it's actually a baby crying. And this baby then is, is, is okay, so oh, Miriam, the sister, is looking out. Uh, shame. What a, I think my sister would do something like this. By the way, I'm talking about her so much because she's sitting right there. Hey, sissy, love you. Um, she would do something like this. She, he, Miriam was lurking the entire time, wanting to see what would happen to the brother, right? And as soon as she realized what was going on, went to Pharaoh's daughter to say, hey, do you want me to find you somebody to actually take care of this child? And the princess was like, yeah, yeah, sure. Clever girl goes to the mom and is like, girl, guess what I got you? Your son back. Jochebed gets to nurse while every other woman is crying because their baby just died. And after some time... After some time, the boy grows up and goes into the palace, which is, which is so interesting, and I want you to track with me, right? Goes into the palace and is raised in opulence. He is trained in the military. He gets premium education. He is raised as an Egyptian prince, a Hebrew boy. A Hebrew boy raised as an Egyptian prince. And the second thing I want you to pay attention to is your uncommon advantage. What is the thing that is so advantageous about you, but is so uncommon, it's almost unfair? And I always use this example about Sukasta Semenya, who is a woman like I am, but has God's extra ibizwani testosterone, and it's allowing her to have everybody else bite her dust when she runs. That is her uncommon advantage. What is yours? What is the thing that Moyen Zaktiwe I man la ulule umpumi? What is that thing? And for Moses, his uncommon advantage, and you'll understand why it's so important later, was that he was raised an Egyptian prince when he was actually a Hebrew boy. And then what happens is he grows up and he wants to go mingle with his people because you can take, you can take out of the jungle, but you can't take, uh, ghetto, you can take me out of the ghetto, but you can't take the ghetto out of me. That is exactly what was happening with Moses. He was like, Inside me, yeah, I am a Hebrew. But my people are out there. He goes to his people. And when he gets there, he finds that they are really, really living and working under 
serious oppression. And he finds one particular Hebrew that is being so abused, he goes there and he tries glamula, nothing works, and he's like, one plus one. And what does he do? And I'm saying this because I know this is recorded on YouTube. It's streamed on YouTube. So let's not do it. And he analyzes the, <laughs> the, the other man from, from Egypt. And so that, that was his way of solving for that problem, right? But what also happens is one day, he sees Hebrew men fighting amongst each other. And he's like, guys, come on. Come on. You're already in oppression. What are you doing fighting amongst each other? And one of them says, ow, oh, when are you going to do to me what you did to that Egyptian? Moses says, you, everybody knows. And he flees the country and he goes to Midian. When he gets to Midian, again, you can take me out of this thing in Moses' heart. He gets there and he's sitting by a well. And he sees seven daughters. Well, he didn't know that they were sisters, but seven ladies come to draw water from the well. And as they're there, some silly shepherd boys torment them and harass them. And true to form, Moses steps in and wants to fight. Now, and I'm, I, I promise you it's going to make sense when I round it all up. The third thing I want you to pay close attention to is your heart. Five minutes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay, okay. Ah, sorry, I'm disturbed. Bingtini, the third thing I want you to focus on is your heart, right? What are the things that everybody else thinks are normal, but you're just like, mm-mm. What are the things that target your heartstrings? What I, almost, I always say to, to my clients that if you had a magic wand and you could just uh, whoosh it, what is the thing that you would want to turn the world into? And yeah, let's move to the next thing. So then the father's like, how, okay, then the girls go back home to say, yo, Baba, let, let's tell you what happened today. We're there drawing water. These men are harassing us, but this guy helps us out. And the dad is like, how, why didn't you bring him over? And he comes over and Jethro, Jethro absolutely loves him gives him one of, one of his daughters and says, okay, because like, uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You're going to work. And he works tending to a flock, got Jethro, right? And while he's doing this one day, he encounters a burning bush. The bush is burning, bush is burning. But it's burning, but it's not getting consumed. And he, he's very curious. What's going on? He goes to this, he goes to this tree, and just as he, he steps closer to it, God says, hold up. Where you're about to enter now is holy ground. Remove your shoes and they have that encounter. They talk, right? And God then hands him his assignment right there. And Moses, Shem, when God says, I've heard the cries of my people. It's been 400 years. I've heard their cries and they're yearning for me to save them. Please go back. Moses is like, me? The stutterer? God's like, yes, you, the stutterer. Okay, your brother's about to come. He will, he will, he will accompany you to Egypt. And he's like, but, 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 but you know, I, I'm not on vacation. I, I ran away because I killed a man. And God's like, okay, that Pharaoh who was after you is dead. I've cleared the way. Moses is like, but, but, but. But what am I going to say? Why me? Because like, that's where you're getting it wrong. I am ascending you. So when I... Wah, 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 wah. I am ascending you. Go. And whoever's questioning... Okay, but Lord, how are they going to believe? And God says, what do you have in your hand? And he says, a rod. And God says, throw it down. Let's see. Uh, you know the story, Moss. You know how it goes. The fourth thing I want you to, be, to, be, to, be, to pay attention to is your position and your possession. A lot of us have, have so many excuses around why we're not blooming. Because we're like, yo, the environment is not allowing. Yo, what do I... What do you have in your hand? And I know a couple of weeks back, um, Pastor Maponga was here. Yeah. 
He was here and he was talking about what you have, right? Speaking about the story of the woman who just thought she had jars, not knowing that she's got a full business and an asset to run, to run an operation for the needs that she had. And the final thing is the answer. I want you to know that sitting here right now, you are an answer to a question somebody has out there. There is something in you, a unique experience, a unique skill, literally an answer that somebody is yearning for, dying to hear. The answer is right with you. And why was Moses the answer to the prayers and the groanings and the heartache of the Egyptians all those 400 years because of his era of existence? Being born in that time was not a coincidence where Moses was concerned. He had to be born in that time. I spoke about an uncommon advantage. Imagine, go to... President Cyril Ramaphosa and send a message. Because I won't even get in. Ubani. Wagupi. Utumengan. It's not enough. But here we have Moses, who was raised in the palace. If anybody could just rock up and speak to Pharaoh, it was him. They were brothers. That was his uncommon advantage. While all the other Hebrews were struggling, oh, homeboy was having a good time in the palace. So he had access. He could easily go there and speak to the king because that was his uncommon advantage. And we know that as they journey, as they journey from Egypt to Canaan, God had to give them Ten Commandments. Who better to administer the law than someone who already had a heart for justice? In the end, Moses Abalege from from Egypt was because was because he, he had a heart for justice. And a grave injustice was being done to his people. When he got to Midian, he still it was injustice that was on his heart. So what is on your heart? Because that is what was, what was in Moses' heart. And then we get to the final point, right? Where God is like, Moses, Moses, come, let's go. Pick up your things, let's go. Why could it be him? He could lead an entire nation of millions of people because while all he thought was he's he's tending to flock God was teaching him leadership God was teaching him patience God was teaching him how to give direction so if there was anybody who could lead a very stubborn people it was Moses who was leading flocks all along and finally when the Israelites get to the Red Sea, and everybody is panicking. It's like, oh my God, I'm so happy. The, the, um, the, the Egyptians are after us. Lana, Lana, there's blockage. What are we going to do? Everybody is panicking. Do we ever read of Moses panicking in the Bible? No, because who is Moses? What is Moses? Literally, his name is one who was taken out of the water. So if there was anybody who could give anybody the assurance that I know a God who takes you out of water, it was Moses because he was literally taken out of the water. So it could not have been anybody else. It had to be Moses because of the time he was born in, his uncommon advantage, his heart, his position and possession, and because the answer laid with him. I'm telling you today to bloom because you are planted. Amen. It's not a matter of if you are planted. You are here with your heart, with your possessions, in your position, literally with everything that God has placed inside of you to bloom. And the problem, once you know something, you can't unknow it. Once you've heard something, you can't unhear it. And today, you are receiving an instruction from God that you need to bloom because you are planted. Literally, everything around us is centered around purpose. The sun, the moon, the st everything. There's nothing insignificant. Now imagine if all these things that were spoken into existence serve a purpose, how much more God's prized creation, the one that after he molded, not, you were not spoken into existence. You were molded into existence. Before he, you were even conceived, God knew you. Now I'm telling you today that it is an expectation that you bloom because you are planted.
It is an expectation for you to solve a problem because God has put the solution inside of you. It is an expectation to answer to the call because people are yearning for what he's put inside of you. So it's not a matter of bloom where you're planted. It is a matter of bloom because you are planted. Amen.